Hey, good morning, Mary Ann. <clears throat> Y'all don't keep scrolling. You just stop. Stop right here. Hang out for a couple minutes. Oh, let's get the yards out, shall we? Mm, there we go. Hope the sisters win the day. We got Marge up next. Good morning, Anna Mae, Linda, Billy. A couple of sisters and a couple of St. Mark's. <laughs> Did I win a prize? You know what? Here's what I'll do for you, Mary Ann. I'll make sure that there's cream in the in the uh, in the fridge for Sunday. <laughs> Competition? Absolutely. And look, the prize should just be that you beat your sister here, right? Jenny glares at me all the time when the kids do this kind of stuff, and they're like, you taught him this. I'm like, well, yeah. <laughs> Was I not supposed to do that? <laughs> Tommy, Debbie, Stephen Dot, good morning, good morning, good morning. Come on in. I'm looking out my window today, and it's like, it was like the sun is just coming up over, and so there's like this perfect like line of light, like right across the trees and across the shed. It's really pretty out this morning, so. And the days are a little lighter when I walk over here. We're getting there, y'all. We are getting there. Fingers crossed, you know? Although, but March is a liar. And everybody knows it. March is a big fat liar, so we'll have to endure. But this week in Pig Talk, um, oh, Tommy gets a second shot today. Rock on. So this week in Pig Talk, we, uh, we, we, what am I saying? Oh, we separated out the little pigs yesterday, so which is never a favorite day, but it's one of those things where they've, they've beaten her, they've beaten Susan up enough. It's time to get them out of there, so. Moved them over, and uh, we've got a separate little area that's a little easier to keep warm. And so they're over there, um, and then we start transitioning them off the milk as best we can into into more of a pellet kind of a feed. And uh, Caleb said that they're eating really, really well. So for that, yes, yes. So, so yeah. So we'll have to we'll pop a couple of pictures up, but little guys are off on their own now. There's one last thing to be done, and it's just to the boys, and I won't say it on here. Uh, but that happens Friday. So that's the last real just yeah, awful part of this. And then we're off and running. So just about got there. So anyway, so yeah, let me come back to that and say, Tommy, congrats. Uh, and uh, and hey, if you're not feeling well, take it easy the next couple of days. I hear the second one can be a little iffy. Um, and so for that, we pray. Um, and while we're on the topic, I got finally scheduled for mine. So in, a, in about 10 days or so, I'm gonna be headed down to M&T going to make a day of it and celebrate uh celebrate getting a shot so um just excited that slowly and surely this starts to this keeps coming so let's get about our work today and today there is a uh there's a bit of a reflection we want to do before we begin uh today's february the 25th we are on page 158 in the book entitled common prayer and i'd like to read for you um because this is relatively new to me i mean i know i was alive in 1994 but i don't remember i don't remember this um but it's a useful lesson for us today that on this day in 1994, a Jewish settler from New York entered the Ibrahimi Mosque in Hebron, which is in the Middle East, with an automatic weapon and killed 29 Muslims during prayer, which has become known as the Hebron Massacre. This massacre has been a landmark in the conflict in the Middle East, which is so often fueled by religious extremists resort reacting to other religious extremists. And here's the kicker for today. It is a reminder that extremists of all faiths have distorted the best that is our faiths have to offer. And it is our prayer that a new generation of extremists for love and grace will rise up. And I pray that that is a prayer we can get behind. That extremism isn't limited to right or left, and it's not limited to a particular, um, it's not limited to a particular faith. It is, it is one of the things that seems to spring up around faith. Um, and so we need to be aware of it as people of faith and call it back from those edges and back, maybe not even to a center, but to a more, to a, to a way of radical love and grace as we pray here. Um, and so just owning that and just being aware that radicalism exists all around us, um, 
and seeking not a radicalism that divides, but rather a radicalism that drives us deep. And it still remains one of my favorite thoughts of all time is that the word radical is the same as the word radish, which means deeply rooted. When it's properly understood, it drives us deep into our deep into our uh, our faith. And so may that be our call, not to push us to the edges or not to invite people to the edges, but rather to drive us deep in love and in grace. And so without further ado, and holding these thoughts in our minds as we ourselves seek to be deeply rooted, let us begin our prayers this morning in a, in a moment of silence. The Lord, let my soul rise up to meet you as the day rises to meet the sun. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. To our colleague for the week of February 21st, we turn praying. God of the wilderness, your spirit leads us to face the truth, unprotected and exposed. Remind our spirits who we truly are. Help us to resist the worship of empty power. And gather us all at your table so that we may find our true food in Jesus Christ, the broken bread. Amen. Turning to our antiphon for today. God, help us shout the good news in our songs and in our lives. And today we pray from Psalm 119, verses 101 to 104. I restrain my feet from every evil way, that I may keep your word. I do not shrink from your judgments, because you yourself have taught me. How sweet are, the word, are your words to my taste. They are sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your commandments, I gain understanding. Therefore, I hate every lying way. To our antiphon again. God, help us shout the good news in our songs and in our lives. We pick up Joseph's story in Genesis chapter 41. Today we'll be reading verses 14 through 45. Um, and we remember we left off yesterday that Joseph had interpreted some dreams for some guys in prison. Those guys work, uh, went back to work for Pharaoh, um, at least the one guy did. Um, and Pharaoh has these two dreams um, that he can't get interpreted. And the guy remembers, oh, yeah, I remember this guy. And so uh, that's where we pick up the story today. Then Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was hurried, hurriedly brought out of the dungeon. When he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, It is not I. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, In my dream I was standing on the banks of the Nile, and seven cows, fat and sleek, came up out of the Nile and fed in the reed grass. 
Then seven other cows came up after them, poor, very ugly, and thin. Never had I seen such ugly ones in all the land of Egypt. The thin and ugly cows ate up the first seven fat cows, but when they had eaten them, no one would have known that they had done so, for they were still as ugly as before. Then I awoke. I fell asleep a second time, and I saw in my dream seven ears of grain, full and good, growing on one stalk, and seven ears, withered, thin, and blighted by the east wind, sprouting after them. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears. But when I told it to the magicians, there was no one who could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years, and the dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years, as are the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the lands of Egypt. After them, there will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty that will be forgotten, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. Excuse me. The famine will consume the land. The plenty will no longer be known in the land because of the famine that will follow, for it will be very grievous. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that this thing is fixed by God, and God will shortly bring it about. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a man who is discerning and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plenteous years. Let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and lay up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to befall the land of Egypt so that the land may not perish through the famine. <clears throat> the proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find anyone else like this, one in whom is the Spirit of God? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only with regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over, the, over all the land of Egypt. Removing his signet ring from his hand, Pharaoh put it on Joseph's hand. He arrayed him in, a, in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in the chariot of the second in command, and they cried out in front of him, Bow the knee. Thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh gave Joseph the name Zephaniah Paneah, and he gave him Asana, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, as his wife. Thus Joseph gained authority over the land of Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. we've been talking about heroes and certainly this hero story which it undoubtedly is um, would be remarkably inspirational to uh to to the people of israel not only that but they're also going the people of israel are also going to remember what comes after this with the exodus and so they will appreciate the irony of the people who had enslaved them had once been answerable to one of them um, and so that irony certainly has its own kind of inspiration with it as well and underneath of it all, and if we can hold this lightly without pushing this too far, we can see Joseph's continued steadfastness and obedience towards God. There is kind of a payoff, isn't there? And we want to be careful about that because we don't want a suggestion. You just do everything right and everything's going to work out for you. And that's not, that's not entirely true. But there is this sense of it. Joseph's story is one of faithfulness throughout. And we get to this place. How did Joseph get here? Well, there's this, there's this idea of faithfulness that is a part of it. And so that too would have been inspiring to the people of Israel and certainly can inspire us that um, that faithfulness in the moment over years has its place. A second reading comes from Hebrews chapter 11, 
We're going to begin in verse 32, and we're going to conclude with chapter 12, verse 2. Speaking of heroes, again, we've been reading these ongoing stories as the author of Hebrews recounts some of Israel's great, uh, great heroes and martyrs of its faith. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. <coughs> this is the word of the Lord. And a powerful word that it is. This passage takes that edge off of what we just talked about with Joseph, like this idea that if we do good, everything will work out fine. Um, you know, we'll end up second in command. Uh, this passage is going to is going to put the lie to that. But this passage invites us to think about, wait a second, we are part of something bigger than ourselves. And that is what is so very, very important, that we stand in a line, and you've heard me preach it before, we receive stuff from upstream and we will send it downstream. And so, but the issue is the stream, like that is, that is what matters. Um, and so this is about saying, listen, we've received all these remarkable stories and these remarkable people who have gone before us have passed something down of immeasurable value. He says, so hold on to it, live it, and make sure it gets passed down. That's what I love. These verses, uh, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, are two of my favorite verses in all the Bible. It says, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us put aside everything that holds us back. It's like, y'all, you can see it. You know the story. So buy into that. It says, look to, G and look to Jesus, who's called the author and perfecter of our faith. And then this is what I love. Who for the sake of the joy that was before him endured the cross. Not some sense of obligation or of trying to get to heaven kind of thing. No, it was joy that drove him to endure the cross and ultimately taken his right hand at the throne of God. And so um, certainly words to inspire us, certainly words that would have inspired the early church and are intended to inspire us as well. We return to our antiphon. God, help us shout the good news in our songs and in our lives. And today we get a uh, get a reflection from Mother Teresa of Calcutta, who said, "To show great love for God and our neighbor, we need not do great things. It is how much love we put in the doing." that makes our offering something beautiful for God. To show great love for God and our neighbor, we need not do great things. It is how much love we put in the doing that makes our offering something beautiful for God. And so let us muster all the love that we can as we pray for our prayer list today. To name these names before God, certainly not a great work, certainly not a 
a certainly not a world changing work, but we have heard that in some ways it has been a life changing work. Um, and so let us pour great love into this work. And uh, we have no further additions today, at least none that I'm aware of. Um, and so without further ado, let us pray. Lord, maybe this time of the pandemic has always been about discerning a great cloud of witnesses that is so much bigger than ourselves. Lord, even in our absence from one another, we've learned a little bit of how much we really do love one another. That there is a sense in which absence makes the heart grow fonder. And Lord, we give you thanks for this community that we call St. Mary's. But Lord, in so many other ways, we've discerned that their community is always bigger than we expected it. How many new people we've met, people, even if it's just through the internet, we've inter interacted with and said, oh my goodness, we didn't know that you were around. We didn't we didn't know ab about you, and we're grateful to get to know you. Those two are a great cloud of witnesses. And then, Lord, certainly in many ways, we've discerned that all of us as the body of Christ, wherever we may be, are in this together and trying to make sense of where we're at trying to make sense of this moment and trying to make sense of what it means to be faithful. And so, Lord, we have discovered that the great cloud of witnesses of which we are a part has grown exponentially, and that is a gift. So, Lord, we thank you for the stories of faith that swirl around us, those from the past and those we're writing right now. Lord, we pray that we would be a faithful church of Jesus Christ to do what you have called us to do with great love, and then to pass that story and that message down to those who will come after us, that they too might live it with even greater love. And so we would pray that you would bless each of us this day, that we might do the work before us with great love. And so to this end, we pray for those who are on our list. And we say thank you, God, for being entrusted with the life of another. And so we lift up their names with all the love that we have in our hearts. Today, we pray for Dave Cunningham, Tom Cross, Brian Cunningham, Ann Wilson, Jeremy Dutterer, Alan Showalter, Sandy Suit, Savannah Price, Karen Anderson, Cart Denner, and unspoken requests struggling with anxiety and depression. For Carolyn Yost, Baby Lacey, Gene Snyder, David Miller, Margie Snyder, an unspoken request dealing with anxiety, depression, and an eating disorder. We pray for Richard and Deborah Hahn, for Steve Moorhead, Joe Zentgraf, Terry Shavius, Jennifer Ramsey, for Caitlin, for Richard and Beatrice Hess, an unspoken request, for Donna Rill, Marsha Brown, Laurie Posey, Artis Tully, Richard Lindsay, Bruce Ludlow, Bob Scott, Helen McQuay, LaRue Newsbaum, Butch McCotter, and Darlene Hayes, for Rob Rickle, for Diane, Joanne Buell, Julie Scher, the family of Billy Behrens, Bert Remmers, Gail Gacharna, Linda Lawson, Mark Fatorno, and Ashley Barber, Perry Lyons, Sandy Lloyd, Nicole Jordan and her baby, for the father of Ashley Bernard, for Nathan Goodpasture, for the family of Susan Heiss, for Bruce Goodpasture, for the people of Texas, for Kristen Oliver, Haley Nicklow, Alina Nicklow, for Leslie and her husband, for the family of Clarence Berg, and for Doug Berry. Lord, hear these prayers we pray as a community. Hear also the prayers that we pray individually. together we join with the great community of faith, the Church of Jesus Christ, as we pray the words he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today, Lord, help us make, a, make our lives an offering of quiet commitment to thread love through the torn garments of society. Amen. And now may the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen. Y'all, thanks so much again for joining in as part of this, uh, as part of our ongoing experiment and what it looks like to pray our way through a pandemic. Um, and to each and every one of you who make time, whether it's now, whether you're coming in later, um, we're just grateful that you are here. Thank you so much uh, for continuing this work of prayer. And so um, our, our prayers for you uh, in the day, whatever today looks like, um, I'm going to be doing a lot of recording, so please, please pray for my voice. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to talking to several of you um, and uh, looking forward to collecting stories um, for our service on Sunday. Um, so keep me in your prayers. But uh, nevertheless, friends, thank you as always. Um, Belinda will be with you tomorrow. So thank you, Belinda, as always. Um, and, uh, and I will be joining in later. So until then, peace and good, y'all.